faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornications. Verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saveth him that receiveth it. Amen. I pray that the Lord will add his blessings as you have your seats tonight. And as we look at this, we're going to look at some things and maybe, like I said, a lot of it may be very informational as we go down through the history of maybe ancient religions such as Babylon and things like that. Um, but, but what we want to see is how this glorious gospel that started out there on the book of Acts and its perfect truth ends up in a situation where it is today where people are so far off from that original word. What was it that that took it in that direction? How did we get to where we're at today? And just a quick reminder here as we look at the the map of Asia Minor, we're we're studying about Pergamos here on this map in the northern part. It is, is called Pergamum, which was the ancient name for it. It is the same place. And this age would be between the years 312 and 606 AD. For those of you who know a little bit about history, this would be during the time of the fall of what we would call the Roman Empire. During this time, uh, pagan Rome or the Roman Empire is actually in decline and, and, is, and is falling. Um, the messenger of this age, the messenger of this age is Martin. Brother Branham says, using our God-given rule for choosing the messenger to each age. That is, we choose the one whose ministry most closely approximates that of the first messenger, Paul. We unhesitatingly declare the Pergamian messenger to be Martin. And I wanted to say as we start this, I want us to remember that we are studying an age. So we're studying a period of time. Okay, and, 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 and things that happen during that age, and yet at times it may seem like we're studying a city. Okay, and, and the reason for that is because I guess in some ways we are, but it's because the, the seven churches in these seven cities had characteristics that would be manifested later in this time period that we're studying. So Brother Branham said it like this. He said the seven churches were especially picked from all other churches for their characteristics, which same characteristics would be found in the successive ages centuries later. And just for an example, to bring it down to what we're trying to say, we we read about the Laodicean church. That was just a church in a city there in Asia Minor 1,900 years ago. But now we are living in the age that that church represented, okay? And the characteristics of that church are now coming to fruition in the very age that we live in. So sometimes don't lose sight of the fact that we're studying what took place in, in a time period and in an age. So, so what we're going to try to do is take all the scripture and what it said about that church and then re- relate it all and see how it unfolds in time and how it unfolds, how, how it fulfills what was spoken in prophecy. So Back to Martin Luther, Brother Branham said, by signs and wonders, by, by the, by the, by, excuse me, <laughs> Martin, by signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit, Martin was truly vindicated as the messenger of that age. But not only was he gifted by a great ministry, he himself was forever true to the word of God. He fought organization. He withstood sin in high places. He championed the truth in word and deed and lived out a full life of Christian victory. And, I, and one thing I want to say is I want that to be the testimony of me when I'm gone. That not, no matter what deeds, no matter what powerful things, may it be said that I lived out a full life of Christian victory. Amen. And One of the things that we read tonight, we're going to start in verse 13. And we're going to talk about where Satan's seat is because he says here, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, 
even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, there's some interesting things said in here that we want to get into because Pergamus was not the original seat of Satan. It's always been, been, been known that Babylon had always been literally and figuratively his headquarters. It was in Babylon that satanic worship had its origin. Now, we're going way back before the church ages here. We're going back to the book of Genesis. It was in Babylon that Satan worship had its origin. And, and, and I want us to see in Scripture and in history that, that the things that we teach you, because sometimes I understand I was raised in the message, and sometimes you're like, well, that's our idea. That's what we believe and true, we do, but what I want us to see is in Scripture and in history that what we hold to as the truth is found there. What we hold to in truth is found in the Scriptures. What we hold to as truth is found in the histories. Uh, the errors of the Catholic Church and the, don the, the denominational world can be found in history. Um, th these aren't just our ideas and, and what we preach. So if, we, if we'll go back and look in Genesis 10, 8 through 10, it says, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Eric, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. So we, we know here, if we, if we know our Sunday school lesson, and you, uh, if you remember from back in your days in Sunday school, we find over in Genesis 11 that the whole earth spoke one language. And the whole earth spoke one language. And there in Shinar, they, they began to build a city and a tower. We, in, in Sunday school, we would know it as the, the Tower of Babel. Okay, and, and they began to build this tower, but God knew that their intention was for evil. He knew it wasn't for good. It was, it was so if the floods ever came again, they could live their life however they wanted and they could run up in this tower and escape judgment. But it was also, it was a monument to man. It was a monument to, to how great that they thought they were. And God knew that their intention was for evil and so he allows their, their tongues to be confused and the people there to be scattered. Babel is the original name for Babylon. All right, so when we talk about satanic worship beginning in Babylon, this is where we're taking it. It means confusion. It was founded by Cush, the son of Ham, and it was brought to power by Nimrod, the son of Cush. And so what we want to see is how did the seed of Satan, and here's what we're focusing on here, as it relates to the affairs of man and to the affairs of worship, go from Babylon to where here in the scripture, God is saying that it's in Pergamos, that this is the seat of Satan. What, how did this transfer happen and what was this Babylonian religion? How then did, did, did the religion of Babylon then become intertwined with Christianity to, to form the hybrid thing that people today call Christianity? We're going to continue to look here at Nimrod and, and, and his desires. It says, Nimrod set out to accomplish three things. He wanted to build a strong nation, which he did. He wanted to propagate his own religion, which he did. And he wanted to make a name for himself, which he also accomplished. During this time, Babylon became the very head of gold amongst the world governments. You know the vision there in the Bible where, where the statue was made of different materials and the head of gold was at the top. That was the Babylonian kingdom. And, and his religion invaded the whole world. And it became the basis, the basis of every system of idolatry, and the theme for all mythology. If you've ever studied mythology in school, you can trace it back to Babylon. If you've ever studied any idolatry, you can trace it back to Babylon. It all goes back to Babylon. And, and, and when you study those things, the names of gods, they may differ depending on the language that the people speak. Um, but it was all started in Babylon and it's still in practice to this day. And so Brother Brandon would pick up on this 
And he would say, ancient histories agree with the Bible that this Babylonian religion was most certainly not the original religion of Earth's early people. It was the first to drift away from the original faith, but it was not the original one. So we know that this religion to where they worship many gods was not original. It wasn't so from the beginning. This religion where they worship nature was not the original. That was not the original. Most religions, historians say that originally the people of earth worshiped one God. So if we're going to go back to the original, just like we always talk about as it relates to the New Testament, going back to Pentecost and, and going back to the original, if we're going to trace it far enough back, you got to go beyond Babylon to get back to the original worship. Original worship was the worship of one God, supreme, eternal, invisible, who by the word of his mouth spoke all things into existence and that in his character he was loving and good and just that is the original religion of the world and of mankind but as always satan will always try to corrupt he's not going to be happy seeing god receiving praise he's not going to be happy seeing god because that's what satan wanted even in the beginning is he wanted worship he wanted to be praised and i want to remind you tonight that's still what he wants be careful where your life gives praise not just on, I know we come here and we praise God on Wednesdays and we praise God on Sundays, but what, where is your time going on Monday and where is your time going on Tuesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday? Is your life giving praise? Is it split between God and Satan? Because Satan is always after your praise. He's after your time and your devotion and he wants you. And when you give time to him and you give time to his idols and you give time to the things of the world, you're getting praise drawn away from God and drawn to the devil. He wants to draw worship away from the one true and living God. And so what he does here in Babylon, what's the point of it? What's the point of this false religion? By setting up his own false religion that he's the author of, then not only does it draw worship away from God, but it now draws worship unto himself. It's being drawn to himself. And Brother Branham says monotheism. If you don't know monotheism, mono means one. That's, that's a religion where there's one God. Turn to polytheism, the worship of many gods, in Babylon. The devil's lie and the devil's mysteries rose up against the truth of God and the mysteries of God in that city. Just some things I want to point out and see if it sounds familiar to you. In Babylon, now this is way before Christianity, they had mother and child worship in the form of the goddess, the mother of Babylon, Semerinus, and her son Ninus. History shows us that Ninus was actually Nimrod. His father was Cush, and he was the father of the polytheistic system by which man began to worship many gods. There in Babylon, they began to worship their ancestors. They began to worship nature. It was in Babylon that gods became identified with the sun, and gods became identified with the moon. Creatures were worshipped in Babylon. And we see over in Pergamos, we covered this last time, that in the city of Pergamos, they actually had a live serpent in the temple that they would worship. So it came all the way to the place where the very creature that represented the devil was now in the temple receiving worship. And the reason I'm going through all this is just to tie in so you understand that all the idolatry and the things that we see in so-called Christianity today has its roots and its ties in Babylon. It has its roots and its ties in the tradition of paganism. There's no place in Christianity for it. Cush was called Baal, and Baal in Roman mythology was Janus. Brother Branham says he is pictured as having two faces. He carried a club by which he confounded and scattered the people. Exactly what happened there at the tower. He says, thus that we find that Cush of the Bible, the original rebel against monotheism, was called Baal, Belus, Hermes, Janus, etc. among the ancient peoples. 
He purported to bring revelations and interpretations from the gods to the people. In so doing, he caused the wrath of God to scatter the people, bringing division and confusion. Brother Brown says the polytheistic religion of the enemy began with the Trinitarian doctrine. It was way back there in antiquity that the one God and three persons idea came into existence. Now, how was this Trinity expressed? It was expressed by an equilateral triangle, even as it is expressed in Rome today. Strange. The Hebrews did not have such a concept. Now, who is right? The Hebrews or the Babylonians? So here we are in the, in the third age. And, and, and way past Babylon. And we're here in the third age. And it's very easy for the pagans to accept Christianity wrapped up in all this ancient pagan ritual and tradition. It wasn't no big leap for them to accept the Trinity. It was no big leap for them to accept a holy mother or praying to saints or praying to ancestors. Because it's what they had always done. This is how they had always worshipped. But now if you just take Christian names and add it to the form they've always been following, it was easy to make that transition. It was simple for them. They already worshipped the great God mother. They already worshipped the sun God. There was already a place of worship for the gods and their sons. Brother Branham says this. Just remember this one thing from now on. I want you to take this because you can apply this to any aspect of your life. These records are facts and this is a fact. Satan is a liar. And the father of lies and whenever he comes with light, it is still a lie. Notice, even if it's light, it's still a lie. Because he cannot tell the truth. He's a murderer. And his doctrine of the Trinity has destroyed the multitudes and will destroy until Jesus comes. Now we see why when we read the scripture, sometimes when you see why the scripture would speak so against Babylon. Why isn't it calling out and saying Rome? Because where did this stuff originate at? It originates in Babylon. You, we see Satan identified with Babylon in Isaiah 14. We see him also uh, uh, identified in Revelation 17 and 18. Why? Because Babylon is where it all began. Babylon was the seat of Satan. So then why, and we've come back to where we started, does it say here, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Well, the Bible's not talking about Babylon here. It's talking about Pergamos. So why? Because as the religion of Babylon had spread across the world, it had taken a great stronghold there in the city of Pergamos. And Brother Branham says that Babylonian priest had fled from Babylon when it was conquered by the Medes and by the Persians, and they had come to Pergamos, and it had now become the very headquarters of their worship from where they pushed out their religion. So as they fled Babylon, they came and they brought their rites and they brought their rituals and they brought their traditions, and they set up here amongst other pagan people, and from here it began to spread. And so I began to do some digging, and I found this very interesting in history. History tells us plainly that it was through the relationship with Pergamos that the religion of Babylon began to grow strong and take control of Rome. So it's connect the dots. You got, you got Babylon, and then we see it over here in Rome, but the dot in between was Pergamos. And I found this in history, I found this very interesting. It says, the second Punic War between Rome and Carthage was still continuing. And they consulted the holy books. So Rome consults their holy books, known as the Sibylline books. And they found verses saying that if a foreigner were to make war on Italy, he would be defeated if the Mater Deum Magna Idea, that's a language I don't speak, but interpreted the great mother goddess 
was brought to Rome. Additionally, an unusual number of meteor showers had been seen. The interpretation from the oracle was that Rome needed to start a cult in Rome to the mother goddess in order to win the war. So according to historian Livy, Attalus, who is the priest Brother Branham actually speaks of in the church age book, receives a delegation from Rome and hands over to them the sacred stone. Trace it back from Pergamus to Babylon. Now here's the Romans in Pergamus and the very priest hands over the sacred stone, which the natives declared to be the mother of God and bade them carry it to Rome. The ancient goddess Cybel was thus introduced to Rome as the Magna Mater or the Great Mother. Well, no wonder that they prayed to the mother of God. No wonder Mary is worshipped. It just carries right back over into the paganism. It says right here, Brother Branham actually said this, and I didn't find it until I got down to the end of the chapter, but I already read this, and he says it almost identically. This comes from history. It says, when Italus, the pontiff, the king of Pergamus, died in B.C. 133, he bequeathed the headship of the Babylonian priesthood to Rome. When the Eustrations came to Italy from Lydia, the region of Pergamus, they brought with them the Babylonian religion and rites. They set up a pontiff who was head of the priesthood. Later, the Romans accepted this pontiff as their civil ruler. Julius Caesar was made pontiff of the order in B.C. 74. In B.C. 63, he was made supreme pontiff of the Babylonian order, thus becoming heir to the rights of the title of Italus, pontiff of Pergamus, who made Rome his heir by will, thus the the first Roman emperor became the head of the Babylonian priesthood and Rome the successor of Babylon. These things aren't just made up. These things are in history. And now it's clear how the succession of pagan polytheistic worship started in Babylon and ends up with its seat and its power in Rome which we're going to see later as we begin to move into this now, becomes intermingled with Christianity to form what we know today is the Roman Catholic Church. Revelations 2.14, he says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So in this age, what we find is God denounces two doctrines. The doctrine of Balaam, which caused Israel to fall into idolatry, and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which had only been needs in the, uh, deeds in the Ephesian age. If you'll remember, you've heard about, we've preached a lot about Nicolaitans and Nicolaitanism. But before this, it was only deeds. But now it has grown to a place where it's known as doctrines. When, when we see the denouncement there in verse 14 and 15, and it's telling us that in this age there's those in the church that have the doctrine of Balaam, and there's those in the church that have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and we see that God also calls it the seed of Satan, it becomes quite clear that the religion of Babylon has already taken hold of the church at this point. It's no longer a pure church. It, it, it's no longer just the, the true vine, as we would say, but how? How did it get to this place? How here in the third age has the false vine gotten such a tight grip? How has this ancient religion of Babylon gotten so ingrained in the church that started out pure? We're talking about we're, we're literally just a couple hundred years away from the day of Pentecost. And yet how has it got to this place? Brother Branham goes into it here and describes it so it's quite easy to understand. He says, when the Christians... Mainly Jews by birth. Understand originally most Christians were Jews. Okay? So when the Christians, mainly Jews by birth, were scattered abroad from Jerusalem, they went everywhere preaching the gospel, particularly in synagogues. Well, what kind of people would you find in synagogues? Jews. So the majority of their converts were once again Jews. Now this is building up to something. Thus within three years, or about in 36 A.D., 
the gospel had been taken to Rome by Junius and by Adronicus. And you find their names there in Romans 16, 7. Paul says, salute Adronicus and Junia for my kinsmen, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are note among the apostles. So they're called apostles. They were brought the gospel who also were in Christ before me. So as Paul writes this letter to the Romans, he addresses Andronicus and Junius as brothers and apostles. And, and because they, they were there in the work in Rome. And what happened in Rome is the gospel flourished. The church was flourishing. I mean, this wasn't some little ro- work there. I mean, but Paul wrote a letter to the Romans. There was quite a work there. There was a church there that was flourishing and growing. But the problem was... It's not necessarily a problem, but it becomes a problem that the majority of the church there was Jews. And the Jews were having great troubles amongst themselves. There were factions and they were arguing and some of it was over Christianity. Some of it was just over Jewish things, right? Cultural things. But also there was a great movement amongst the Jews that were fighting for more what we would call um, political freedoms within the city of Rome. And it was causing a political upheaval. So in order to deal with this, Emperor Claudius just says, we're going to expel all Jews from the city. No Jew can stay in the city, and all Jews are kicked out of Rome. They're gone. So without the Jews there, what's left behind is a very small fragment of the church of Rome. The the Christian church that had been there, and it had a great impact because most of the Christians are now gone. Most of the early leaders of this church were Jews, and now the leaders of the church are gone. And because of this, Brother Branham says, with the Jews banished from the city, the backbone of that little church was practically broken. Perhaps even the elders had been Jewish, and so they would be gone. The flock would be unattended, and since the word had not been written as a guide, it would be very easy for this little flock to drift or be inundated by the philosophers and the pagans of that day. In other words, the elders that were there to keep the wolves out weren't there. The ones that were there to to teach them in the word and teach them the truth weren't there. So even though these were believers, they were easily swayed by winds of doctrine. They were easily swayed when somebody said, well, doesn't this make sense? And doesn't this make sense? And the elders weren't there to protect them from these teachings. And without proper leadership, the church in Rome began to slide into false doctrines. It began to slide into paganisms. And pagan rituals began to come into church under Christian titles. Things that we spent the first 15, 20 minutes talking about, things from Babylon, now just rebranded with new names and packaged as the gospel. And these people, it was easy for them to take that step because it was familiar. It was something that they knew. And then after 13 years, Andronicus and Junius are allowed back in the city. And they come back to Rome only to find altars set up in the church where incense is burned and and pagan rituals are carried out to ancestors. Brother Branham says the established leaders of the church. Now we're talking about the church at Rome. There's new leadership now there. There's been 13 years without the elders, without the, 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 the ones that were grounded in the gospel. And new leaders have risen up and they're not the good kind. He says these established leaders of that church could not be approached. In other words, what are we dealing with here? Nicolaitanism. We're the priests. You can't come talk to us. This is how we do it. Y'all just, you know, they were unapproachable. They had been separated into a different class. So with the few who had tried to remain faithful, they started a new church or the second church of Rome. And God graciously worked amongst them by signs and wonders so that they grew and even a third church was started. Brother Brown says, and though the first church was reproached for being pagan and not Christian in its worship, it would not give up its title, but remained and still remains the first church of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. That church became the Roman Catholic Church. But what stood out to me right here is it says, with the few who had tried to remain faithful, that they started a new church and God graciously worked among them. Listen, if you'll remain faithful, 
It doesn't matter what everybody else is doing if you'll remain faithful. It doesn't matter what this church is doing or that church. You know what? Let's, let's go beyond that. Let's bring it down individual. It don't matter what your friend is doing and what this is doing. If you'll remain faithful, God will work in your life. God will move in your life if you will just remain faithful and true to the word. That first church began to thrive. Now, when we use the word thrive here, we don't mean spiritually. We mean they began to become powerful. The first church began to thrive and multiply so in numbers that the emperors and various officials of the government actually favored that church for political reasons. Now, this is where the church gains real power. Once again, not power from God, but power from man. Thus, when the leaders of the first church of Rome found themselves in favor, they took the opportunity to turn the government against the true believers and demand their persecution unless they came into their fold. They recognized that their numbers had grown so big that they had great political power because they had influence and they had wealth. And they began to turn the government against the true vine. We can take this all the way back. We've been teaching you about the true vine and false vine all the way back to the book of Genesis. And that false vine hates that true vine. And it begins to turn the power of the government against the true vine and begin to persecute them. And Polycarp, who's one that we've spoken briefly about, traveled 1,500 miles to come to Rome to try to speak to the leaders of this first church to plead with them to not go down this road, to turn from their wicked ways, to, to get away from the paganism and things of that nature. And when he gets there, he witnesses for himself so-called Christians bowing before images named after apostles and saints, burning candles and incense upon the altars, celebrating Passover in the name of Easter. Brother Brown says, God spoke through him just as he was leaving from Hosea 4 said, Ephraim is married to his idols. Let him alone. And Polycarp leaves and never returns. So this brings us to a place, a term you may hear if you've ever studied even American history a little bit. We would say the separation of church and state. And what that's talking about is religious affairs and political affairs are not supposed to be intertwined. But what we find here is the marriage of church and state. When the true church would not incorporate pagan festivals and worship, the false vine would use their power in government to bring persecution. They would, not, they would not do as he requested, so he prevailed upon the government officials to persecute the believers, hailing them into court, casting them into prison, and even meeting out death to many. Brother Brown says, Emperor Symptomus Severus was prevailed upon by Callistus, to kill 7,000 at Thessalonica because these true believers celebrated the Passover according to the Lord Jesus, not according to the worship of Astarte. Listen, I've said it a bunch of times. I want to say it again. Don't ever forget what other people have had to go through just to worship God. Don't take for granted the fact that you're sitting here tonight in freedom. Don't take for granted that we can gather on Wednesday and Sunday and worship God with our whole heart openly and, un and unashamed and unafraid. People have given their life by the millions, by the millions just to call on the name of Jesus. And in this time, that's what's going on. Already the false vine was turning loose its anger against the living God by killing the elect, even as did its forebearer Cain, kill Abel. It embarked upon a constant campaign to discredit the true seed. They claimed that they and they alone were the true representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ and vaunted the fact that they were the original church in Rome and they alone were the first church. So here we are in the middle of the third age and we have two churches bearing the same name. Two churches claiming to be the church of God, the true church. One is a hybrid that has drifted away from the word and taken in pagan ritual and pagan worship mixed with Christian ideas, and she has all the signs of death following her. The other is the true vine, persecuted and hated, but she stays true to the word. 
Brother Branham says, she follows the word and the signs follow her. Amen. Hey, listen, if you stay true to the word, if it's all about the word and you're faithful to the word, the signs follow the word. Brother Brown says, the sick are healed, the dead are raised. She is alive with the life and the word of God. She loves not her life, but holds to his name and his faith even unto death. Let that be our testimony tonight. We hold to his word. We hold to his faith and the signs follow. Amen. Around this time, there comes what seems to be a great reprieve. We're, we're in, the, in, the, in the fourth century and Constantine rises to power and he grants religious freedom in the year 313. And although it ended the heavy persecution for a period of time, it actually led to an even greater marriage between church and state, which as I said, are political affairs and spiritual affairs because Constantine felt that he could help the church by bringing all the people together, both sides, bringing them all together in this great big fellowship to settle the growing divide amongst the Christians on many issues. It was Constantine who called for the Nicene Council of 325. He thought he could bring all the groups together and they could iron out their differences and they could all be one. Now, I know that sounds fine and dandy, but it'll never be so. Because the true vine and false vine can never be one. It can never happen. But the very name Pergamus means thoroughly married. And indeed, state and church were married. Politics and religion were united. The offspring of that union have been consistently the most horrible hybrids the world has ever seen. The truth is not in them. But all the evil ways of Cain, the first hybrid, is. So the power of the emperor, Constantine, is now coming together with the influence and the power of that first church. They're already powerful, and Constantine feels like he can help, and, and this is the true marriage of church and state. And so after Nicaea, what you find is things that were debated are now put down in iron as doctrine. The Trinitarian doctrine is now totally entrenched into Christianity and forced upon the people because now it has the power of the emperor behind it. Now it has the power of the government behind it. Now the only truth is the Trinitarian doctrine. You must accept the Trinitarian doctrine. It is for, it's forced upon the people in their worship. It's forced upon the people in their baptism. Prayer to saints and to Mary are, are, are now not only common practice, but it's doctrine and it's expected because the government is now behind it. The emperor is now behind it. And Brother Branham says, and right in this age, now remember I mentioned earlier, this is during the fall of the Roman Empire. And right in this age is when the beast of Revelation 13 and 3 that was wounded to death, and we'll, and we'll get to it in a minute, I believe we'll, have, we'll read it. The beast that was wounded to death, that was the pagan Roman Empire, comes back to life and power as the holy Roman Empire. Rome as a material nation had suffered much depletion and soon would suffer it completely. In other words, that empire was falling. But it mattered not now for her religious empire would keep her on top of the world, governing from the inside where she would not appear to do so from the outside. Just so you have a, a brief understanding the Roman Empire, when we talk about the Roman Empire, we're not talking about the Pope and the church and the bishops and the cardinals. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the military power that ruled the, wor or the world. That's known as pagan Rome. And at the same time as it was collapsing, that's the time that we see what they call the Holy Roman Empire rise into power. Now things like the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope, the priest, and all that. So it spoke of in the book of Revelation when there was a deadly wound given to the beast, but then the wound is healed. Right? Pagan Rome is killed, but papal Holy Roman Empire raises up in its place. And so that's kind of what we're speaking of right here. The decline and fall of the Roman Empire Pagan imperial Rome, civil wars had weakened it. Foreign wars had weakened it. Social and financial crises had weakened it. Corrupt and poor leadership had weakened it, and it was collapsing. 
And we see its collapse even here in Revelation 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his ten horns, ten crowns. And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power. Where's the power for this empire come from? The dragon. And his seat and great authority. The Roman Empire, it was great, great authority. But look in the next verse. And I saw one of his heads as it was wounded to death. The fall of the Roman Empire. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Now you have the church rising up in power, whereas militarily it no longer is. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. So, so in this age, as the pagan Roman Empire starts to crumble and the city of Rome itself falls, it's, it's sacked by the vandals and, and the, the city itself falls, then papal or false Christian Rome rises out of those ashes. And it rises into power to the point that today Rome is known as the eternal city. Think about that. What blasphemy? Talking about it had names of blasphemy. What blasphemy? There's but one eternal city. And I can promise you Rome is not it. Rome, the eternal city. And it looked like Rome was finished. But when Constantine joined church and state, when he brought them together, it gave Rome a new lease on life. It gave them another opportunity to flourish. And now papal Rome or false Christian Rome or what we would call as the Holy Roman Empire would rule by religion more than it had ever ruled by its military. It would conquer more, take more, destroy more, divide more than its military had ever done. The power of the church, Brother Brown says, the name Christian, which originally brought persecution. Now think about this now became the name of the persecutors. It was in this age that Augustine of Hippo set forth the precept that the church ought and must use force if necessary to bring her children back into the fold and that it was in harmony with the word of God to kill the heretics and apostates. They literally taught that they were helping you by killing you. It was the only way to bring you salvation. It was the only way to bring you back into the fold. So if you didn't see it the way they saw it and you wouldn't accept it, then, you know, it's God's will that we kill you in order that you might possibly obtain some sort of salvation in all this. And so they began to teach this, that it was actually in harmony with the word of God to kill the heretics. And who were heretics? Anybody who didn't accept the Trinity doctrine. Anybody who didn't lift up the church of Rome as the great and all-powerful and the, and the mother of all. Anybody who didn't you know, elevate Satan to the place that he wanted to be elevated were heretics. In other words, the true vine was heretics. And during this time, their thirst for blood was growing. The false vine attacked every way it could using the power of government and the law to persecute the true vine. And so what we'll find if you do any study on your own is that from this point on, especially through the dark ages, the false vine will persecute and destroy the children of the true vine. And yet the whole time claiming the exact same father, just like Ishmael and Isaac. Claiming that they're the church. Brother Brown says the darkness of spiritual corruption will deepen and the true light of God will fade until number-wise, it glows ever so faintly. Yet the promise of God will hold true. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness can do nothing about it. Aren't you glad tonight to hear that? That in the midst of all this chaos and in the midst of the darkness, I know it was dark then, and it's a different type of persecution, but it's never been darker than, it's, than it is right now. And he says, the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness can do nothing about it. Listen, the whole world has gone mad. The whole world has gone into complete chaos. The, the whole world is tainted with this false Babylonian religion. The, the people of the world have given their mind over to the beast. 
Right now, I'm speaking of right now's condition. Their mind has been given over to the beast. And yet in the midst of all that, the light shineth in darkness. It shall be light in the evening time. Listen, that's the word of God. You can count on it. You just hold true, little flock. You just stand true. No matter what others do, no matter what others proclaim, the light will shine in darkness and darkness can do nothing about it. I'm thankful for that, that it has no power over sons and daughters of the light. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Revelations 2.15 says, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So if we find that he hates it, I think we should hate it. And if he hates it, we should know exactly what it is. And I know we've covered this a bit. We covered it in the Ephesian age. And and then we talked about how Nicolaitan was a combination of two words, two Greek words, which meant to conquer the laity. Okay, to conquer the laity. So we're going to look at the doctrine of the Nicolaitans here for a minute. He says, it is terrible because God has never placed his church in the hands of an elected leadership which moves with political mindedness. He has placed his church in the care of God-ordained, spirit-filled, word-living men who lead people through feeding them with the word. Amen? Listen, Nicolaitanism wants to divide people. It wants to separate people. It wants to put people in different classes, and you have to come under me because of the position that I hold. God doesn't separate people into classes so that the masses are led by a few power-hungry individuals. That's not how God operates, but power-hungry and politically motivated who are considered holier than those that they lead. That is not God's way. It is not scripture that this priest is more holy than all the people that he feeds communion to. That's not scriptural. Sure, leadership should be holy, but so should the whole congregation be holy. Sure, leadership should live a holy life, but so should the whole congregation live a holy life. The, the scripture doesn't teach that ministry is to mediate between God and the people. It doesn't teach that. The ministry isn't separated in its worship from the people. We're to worship together. We're all to worship God together. There is no levels to it. Brother Branham says, God wants all to love and serve him together. Nicolaitanism destroys those precepts and instead separates the ministers from the people. Listen, there are ministries out there or let's just not put on ministers people in general who don't understand how it's supposed to work ministers are servants it is not to be put on a pedestal if you don't want to be a servant you don't want to be in ministry that's what it's about okay that's where it's supposed to be God wants all to love and serve him together. Nicolaitan destroys these precepts and instead separates the ministers from the people and makes the leaders overlords instead of, what's it say the ministers are? Instead of servants. <clears throat> well, I'm a minister. I'm the minister, so I get to do, I'm a minister, so I get, I, no, you're a minister, serve. We get that out of balance. We get, we get that messed up in our head of how it's supposed to work. They are overlords instead of servants. Ministers are to be, yes, yes, there's a respect for the office. No, I'm not taking that away. Surely you got enough sense to see that. But it's not some overlord, you must listen to me, and I'm holier than you, and this. That's not how to, we're in this together. We're fighting this battle together, and you are every bit as important as I am, and I'm as important as everybody, and we're in this together, and I can't make it without you, and you can't make it without me, and God doesn't divide us into classes of people for our worship. That's not how it is. This isn't about one man and one group of men overlording over another or one ministry overlording over other ministries. Gee, listen, that's chains. That's denominations. Jesus came to set us free from all that nonsense. 
He came to set us free from that. Not, so you could be free. Not so man could rule over you. Not so a church could rule over you. So you could serve him in freedom. So you could serve him and worship him in spirit and worship him in truth. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter 2, 9. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. What's he say in Revelation 1, 6? And has made us kings and priests. We're all to enter into this together. But what they did here is they began to set up offices of authority that weren't scriptural. They set up bishops who would have authority over the local leaders in each congregation. So you may have a minister or an elder here that was over this church, but then somewhere there was a bishop who was over all the ministers of the 10 churches in this area. And then somewhere there was an archbishop that was over all the bishops. And then it was this hierarchy of power and political and political minded thinking. Bishops decided who would rise up in the ministry. Who would be in power in this area? And the whole hierarchy was set up for what purpose? To control the people. Listen, we are to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. You are to be controlled and be submissive. And yes, you are to come under a pastor. There's no doubt. We're not trying to get those things confused. But we're talking about it's not a hierarchy of authority placed by man. God calls his men into position. God puts leadership into men's life. We're not placing men into those positions. So instead of God-called, Holy Spirit-led leadership in each local assembly, you had a headquarters somewhere. And you were told exactly how and when things should be done. Brother Brown says, men began to vie for the office of bishop with the result that this position was being given to the more educated and the more materially progressive and politically minded men. So what happens when it comes that way, then no longer is the qualification for a bishop or minister uh, a dedicated God called life. But it's who's the most educated, who can operate in this ceremony the best, who, who, who knows the rituals, and, and who's connected most in politics. And so suddenly, you ended up with a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, every spirit and operating in high places. Brother Brown says, with man-made doctrines of the elevation of bishops to a place not according to them in Scripture, the next step was the handing out of graded titles that built into a religious hierarchy. For soon there were archbishops over bishops and cardinals over the archbishops. And by the time of the Boniface the Third, there was a pope over all or a pontiff. As we already talked about the pontiff or the priesthood of Babylon. And just so you'd have an understanding of what this looks like, here's how it's set up. So if you were a Catholic, tonight you'd be at the very bottom of all this and that's where you're at in their world and over you is priest and then over priest are bishops and then over the bishops are archbishops and then over the archbishops are cardinals and over all of them is the pope and it's a trickle-down effect and you have no say in anything you can't even talk to God for yourself it takes a priest to mediate for you and you have to tell him all your problems and all yours. You have no direct relationship with God at all. They took it all from the people. And they set up this hierarchy. Brother Brown says, thus that which started as a deed in the first age. Notice it was a deed. Was made a literal doctrine and so it is today. Bishops still claim power to control men and deal with them as they desire. Placing them wherever they so will in the ministry. This denies the leadership of the Holy Ghost. Who said separate me Paul and Barnabas for the work whereunto I have called them. This is anti-word and anti-Christ. Listen I just I went to Matthew 23 and 8. Because you know in, in this, it's the, 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 you got the bishops and the archbishops and they call them father this and father that. But Matthew 23 and 8, Jesus says, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. 
And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. How was it that pagan Rome, the Roman Empire, came to power? Divide and conquer. How is it that the Christian Empire or Papal Rome did it? They divided Nicolaitanism. Divide and conquer. Levels divide the people. Separate the people into different levels and then conquer the laity. That's exactly the same spirit and tactic they use to conquer the world militarily is the exact same thing they use in the religious world to conquer the world. Divide and conquer. They excommunicated all the righteous leaders. They burned the scrolls. They said it took special education to understand the word. They took the word out of the hands of the common people. So now your only source would be what the priest tells you. You had no way to know. And then the word was only written in Latin, so the common people a lot of times couldn't even read it. They had no idea what it said. You weren't even allowed to have it. You had to trust what the priest told you. He says, having taken away the word from the people, it soon came to the people, it soon came to the people listening only to what the priest had to say and doing what he told them. They called that God and his holy word. They took over the minds and lives of the people and made them the servants of a despotic priesthood. And so today we find that the Roman Catholic Church calls herself the mother church. And no doubt, she is. She is the mother church. She was the original church that, that backslid away from the gospel. She was the first church of Rome, and in her was found the deeds and the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. As a mother, she has produced daughters. All the churches that have come out of her and then turned and went right back under her spirit of organization are her daughters. They have went right back to the spirit of organization, Nicolaitanism, and God says, I hate it. He hates that spirit. He hates that spirit that would come in and control when he says, come out of her, my people. He says, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that you be not uh, partakers and receive of her plagues. And listen, I want to charge you, no matter how long time tarries, no matter how long we stay here upon the earth, no matter how long this goes on, because we don't know how long it will be, no matter who comes or goes, no matter what doctrines rise up, you remember this, you are free. You are a free people and you are to remain a free people. You're not to come underneath some headship, come underneath some headquarters. You are to be led by the Holy Ghost, led by a Holy Ghost filled ministry. That's what you are to be led by. Stand fast in that liberty. Don't ever go back into that. Don't ever go back into something that would bind down your worship, clamp down on how you're supposed to serve God, but you fight for whatever you have to fight and, and however you have to fight in order to stay free no matter how long time tarries because that spirit of denominationalism, that spirit of Nicolaitanism will come around and try to reclaim people. But you got to say, no, I ain't, I ain't standing for that. I ain't falling for that, but I'm going to remain free. Amen. Brother Brown says, no wonder people are mixed up today. If they were so mixed up then, so close to Pentecost, now they are in a most desperate condition, about 2,000 years away from the original truth. Oh, church of God, there is only one hope. Get back to the word and stay with it. Get back to the word. And I'm, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. And I don't mean this negative towards ministry. I'd be throwing shade at myself if, I, if that was the case. But if the ministry can stand up here and preach false doctrine to you service after service after service after service and you don't catch it, that's your fault. There is a feeding that you are supposed to do. There is, you are supposed to be in the word. You are supposed to be feeding. You are supposed to be digging. It shouldn't come as a surprise that, oh, wait, we've been hearing false stuff all this time. You should recognize it right off the bat. Something don't sound right. That trumpet don't give a certain sound. Something's wrong with that. You ought to be in the word enough to recognize when something isn't right. 
Get back to the word, he says, and stick and stay with it. Another doctrine that he says he hates is the doctrine of Balaam. And I'm sorry, that on the right for some reason doesn't show up. I'll read it to you. Revelation 2.14, he says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. And the quote here says, You see... Now listen close. We're going to get into a a few things right here as we're on the downhill side of this. Listen close. Brother Brown says, Now you see, if you take away the word of God and the moving of the spirit as a means of worship, then you will have to give the people another form of worship as substitute. And substitution spells Balaamism. If you take away the word of God and the moving of the spirit as a means of worship, then you will have to give the people another form of worship as a substitute. And substitution spells Balaamism. Right here, Brother Branham ties it together. And right here is why we fight so hard against this. I know over and over, Brother Tim, Brother Joe, Brother Timothy, and myself, we cry out against this spirit that would want to come in and clamp down on the moving of the spirit or what we might would call freedom of worship, the ability to worship him in spirit and truth as the spirit moves upon your life. Because it's not, we're not here for Nicolaitanism where I tell you how the spirit should move on each one of you. It's not going to move the same on you as it does on me, or shall I say it like this, you're not going to respond exactly the way I do or all nature different but there must be a response and we're not going to sit here and allow this thing to be clamped down upon us to where we accept Balaamism as our form of worship now what's interesting is brother Branham now goes and makes it very clear what Balaamism is taking away the moving of the spirit and Nicolaitanism and all that's left is a substitute he ties this together and that substitute is the doctrine of Balaam We're going to get into it. Brother Man says, Now we know that Israel was the chosen people of God. They were the Pentecostals of their day. They had taken refuge under the blood, and they had been baptized in the Red Sea. And they came up out of the waters, singing in the Spirit and dancing under the energy of the Holy Ghost. Now, this sounds like a good meeting to me. Now, some people would have sat back and criticized and called it fanaticism and emotionalism. It sounds like a good meeting to me. And they come out of that, and they're journeying to the promised land, and they come to a place called Moab. And Moab was the son of Lot by one of his own daughters, and Lot was Abraham's nephew. So Israel and Moab are related. They're related And Israel asked permission to pass through the land as they journeyed to their promised land. And they say, look, we're family. We mean you no harm. We just want to pass through. If we take anything, if we eat anything, if we drink anything, we'll pay for it. No problem. Just just let us pass through. We're, We're not here to hinder you. We're not here to bother you. We're just on the way to a promised land. Is that how you feel tonight? Look, I'm not here to tell everybody else how to do what they need to do. I'm just going to go to the promised land. And I'm going to worship God in freedom while I do it. And they're just saying, we're just going to the promised land. We mean no harm. But notice, I want you to notice why Balak was so against them and their march to the promised land. Listen to what the prophet of God says. But King Balak got very excited. That head of that Nicolaitan bunch was not about to let the church come through with its signs and wonders and diverse manifestations of the Holy Ghost, with their faces shining with the glory of God. It was too risky as he might lose some of his crowd. My, Balak didn't want his people to see victory. Balak didn't want his people to see what real freedom looked like in the house of God. Balak didn't want it seeing what it looked like when people had been completely set free. And and since they didn't have it there at their place in Moab, he had to be against it. And he had to teach against it and how it was all wrong. And it was all emotion. And it was all work up in case some of his people might join the march to the promised land. Well, listen, I say come join us on our march to the promised land. 
Don't be bound down in that Balaam religion. Be free. You're supposed to be free today, not bound up. He was so afraid of it that he wanted to curse it. So afraid of it that he hires a, a hireling prophet named Balaam. And we know the story how that God turned Balaam down. But because of the rewards and the favors of man, now notice, take Balaam and place him over here in the age where people are becoming powerful as bishops and cardinals because of reward and power. And what is it that sways Balaam? More money, more power. Well, I know God said no, but I'll give you, I'll give you more position. I'll give you more power. Ask God again. And so because of this, because of the rewards all for him, Balaam kept right on asking. Listen, young people, once God has spoken, that is his answer. And if you continue begging, you aren't looking for his will. You're looking for his permission. And that's totally different. Once he speaks, take that answer. Don't keep begging. Because he may give in, and that's a dangerous place to be. So Balaam went back to God, Brother Brown says. Now one answer from God should have been enough, but not for self-willed Balaam. Young people, we can't be self-willed. Self-willed gets you in trouble every time. We got to look for God's will. I don't want to be self-willed. Lord, take my will out of me. Not my will, Lord, but thy will be done. Brother Branham says, self willed Balaam. He says he should have realized that this was simply God's permissive will and he wouldn't be able to curse them if he went 20 times and tried 20 times. How like Balaam are people today? They believe in three gods. They get baptized in three titles instead of the name. And yet God will send the spirit upon them as he did upon Balaam. And they will go on believing that they are exactly right. And here they are actually perfect Balaamites. Well, God blessed me, so I must be doing right. God, God poured his spirit out on me, so I must be doing right. No, you're operating in his permission. You're not operating in his will. And that's the route that Balaam took. And it's a false teaching. I want to look at this close now. Listen. Listen. In this time, and this constantly comes up, I understand that. But if you read this portion of the church age book, you came across it yourself. In this time where people are constantly questioning emotion and questioning the supernatural and questioning the Holy Ghost, I want you to watch this next part real close. He killed a ram signifying the coming of the Messiah. Man, Balaam knew what to do. He knew what to do to approach unto God. He had the mechanics just right. Let me break that down when we say that. He understood the doctrines. He understood the teachings. He understood the Godhead. He had water baptism just right. He went to church on Sunday and Wednesdays. He knew everything by the letter just right. I'm going to say it again. He had the mechanics just right, but not the dynamics same as now, can't you see it, Nicolaitans? Church, that can't be no plainer. Same as now, can't you see it, Nicolaitans? And there was Israel down there in the valley offering the same sacrifice, doing the same things. Now, they're doing exactly what Balaam's doing. But only one had signs following. Only one had God in their midst. Form won't get you anywhere. It can't take the place of spirit manifestation. That is what happened at Nicaea. They put over Balaam's doctrine, not the doctrine of God, and they stumbled, yea, they fell, and they became dead men. Even like Tabernacle, let us never become dead men where we get lifted up and prideful in what we know and the mysteries of this and we know this and we know that. But let it be because we have God in our midst. If you want to get anywhere, it's because you've got the Spirit of God in your midst and God's moving and God's changing and God's healing and God's saving. And it's God moving in this place. And let's not get to a place of form and tradition and lift it up in the mechanics of it all. 
He knew the mechanics. He knew the rules. He knew the letter of the law. He knew the quotes. But he was lacking the dynamics. And Brother Branham says, Nicolaitans. He says, only one had God, and it was the one with signs following. Not the one with perfect form. Not the one with perfect church order. The one with signs following. And so he can't curse them. And Balak wants to take Balaam down and show them their back parts. What's this mean? It means he wants to show them their faults and their failures, their issues and their struggles, their carnal side. Hello, we have a carnal side. Come on, let's take our halos off. I didn't even have one, but if you do, we have a carnal side. We all have faults and failures. And if you study your brother and sister's faults and failures long enough, that'll be all you see. Come on, look, I still need all the grace. And I need to extend grace. But Balak says, let's take them around and see their faults and failures and their carnal side. Surely there's enough faults that we can curse them. Now notice the attitude. Look, don't de-Christianize people when you see their faults and failures. You see where that spirit comes from. Now I'm not talking about somebody living in sin. You know what I'm talking about here, a struggle or a fault or a stuff. Let's quit de-Christianizing people. Surely these aren't God's people. Surely that ain't the Spirit of God moving down at Evening Light Tabernacle. Look at all the flaws in that church. I love this. He says, yes, Israel had her back parts, carnal parts. They had their side that wasn't praiseworthy. But in spite of their imperfections, by the purpose of God that works through election. Now, hallelujah. He says, by grace and not by works, they had the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. They had the smitten rock, the brazen serpent, and the signs and wonders. They were vindicated not in themselves, but in God. May our vindication not be in ourselves tonight, but may it be in God and his presence amongst us. Are there faults and failures? Absolutely, but God's with us. Have you stumbled and messed up? Absolutely, but God is amongst us. God is working in our midst. What vindication do you have? God is moving in our midst. That's the vindication they have. And so Balaam formulates a plan to cause Israel to fall like Eve in the garden. By flesh desire. Balaam knew that if Israel fell in sin, that God would have to deal with them in death like he had in the garden. So he sends out an invitation. Now remember, we're studying an age. We're going to just bring this right back to our third age. But Balaam sends them an invitation to a great feast. A fellowship, as it were. And they accept, and and during this feast, there's dancing and music and carousing and things of that nature. And the men of Israel fall into lust and fall into adultery, which was Balaam's plan all along. Falls into this with the women of Moab, and God slew 42,000 of them. And this is exactly what happened at Nicaea. Because the true church had vindication. The true church had God working in their midst. The true church had signs and wonders even though there were few. And the false vine invited them to a fellowship at the Nicene Council where they fell into reasoning. And they fell into Balaam's doctrine. And he says, and that is what Constantine and the successors did at Nicaea and after Nicaea. They invited the people of God to the convention. And when the church sat down to eat, And rose up to play, partaking of church forms, ceremonies, pagan feasts, named after Christian rites. She was trapped. She had committed fornication. And God walked out. May we never get to a place where God gets up and walks out. Let's not settle for form and tradition. Let's not settle for something that's a little more sensible. A little more tame. Let's not settle for cold and formal, but let's be identified by the moving of the Spirit. Identified by God in our midst. Identified by Him working, by signs and wonders and worship in spirit and in truth. At the Nicene Council, pagan feast 
with new Christian names were added. Apostles' Creed was given to the people. Ancestor worship was taught to the people. Confessing their sins to men was taught to the people. They were partakers with the devil and not of the Lord. They were in idolatry whether they admitted it or not. Brother Brown says they can say what they want. And he's talking about today's churches. But they are partaking in the well-known Babylonian satanic religion and have joined themselves to idols and committed spiritual fornication, which means death. They are dead. So the church and state were married. The church joined up with idols. With the power of the state behind them, they felt that now the kingdom had come and God's will had been enforced upon the earth. So this is where it begins to go down that path of complete idolatry and complete fornication. We just have a little, a little couple of slides here left as we wrap this up. The warning. Revelation 2, 16. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Brother Branham says, what else can he say? Can God overlook the sin of those who have borne his name in vain? There is only one way to receive grace in the hour of sin. Repent. Confess you are wrong. Come to God for forgiveness and for the spirit of God. But still the grace of God cries out, repent. Oh, how sweet are the thoughts of repentance. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. I bring my sorrow. I repent that I am what I am and what I have done. Now it is the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What will it be? Repentance or the sword of death. It's up to you. What grace. Think about this for a minute. All that's going on in this age. All the falling away, all the falsehoods, all the killing, all the turning and adding and, 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 and the blasphemy that's going on. And yet God is crying out, repent. He's still pleading. He's still calling. He's still giving an opportunity of grace. Repent or else. He's given opportunity. And listen, I'll tell you right now, young person, even tonight, he's still calling and giving opportunity. He's still pleading with those that are struggling. He's still offering you grace tonight. I love how Brother Branham says right here the last um, four words. It's up to you. You've been failing. You've been falling. You've been mixed up in the, in the idols of the world. You've been getting lukewarm, relying on being a church member. You've been growing cold. It's up to you. You have an opportunity, even through the scripture tonight. Repent. You still have opportunity. Oh, Brother Aaron, this is a church age study. That ain't even how this service is going. What I'm telling you is, is it's not too late. Wherever you're at, it's repent or else. You haven't crossed the line. I don't care what the devil's telling you. I don't care what situation you find yourself in, what sins, how many times you've fallen down. He's calling out for you tonight, repent. There's an opportunity for you to repent. To light that fire once again and, 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 and grow strong again. Because there will be not just a warning, but there is a reward. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saveth he that receiveth it. Brother Branham goes into this just a little bit. He talks about that hidden manna. And he talks about the manna that had been put inside the ark and how it would never spoil and how down through the ages they could come get a taste of it. And then he kind of starts talking about how in each age, by revelation, God gave back a little bit more of the original manna. And he, and he would break it off and give it to the messenger, but it wasn't just for themselves, but to the overcomers, they got to eat of that manna as the messenger would pass it out to the people of that age he gave back things that had been hidden, and he allowed the saints to taste of the pure, unadulterated word. And then in our day, it was all opened up. All the mysteries were revealed, and you have the opportunity now as an overcomer to partake of all the hidden manna. You can eat from that, that which has been hidden down through the ages. Like I said, Jesus would give it to the messengers of the age, and they in turn would give it to the people. And then he says, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name 
written, which no man knoweth. And the way Brother Branham broke this down, just it excited my heart as I read it. And he talked about how Rome, when they got the power of the treasury, they had tapped into all the resources and all the money. And they had built these giant uh, cathedrals and these giant temples. And they would all be made out of white stone, all out of marble. They took all the money from the, from the poor. And he said, the, the true seed, maybe they didn't have that marble. Maybe they didn't have statues built out after them. He said, God wasn't in the marble and in, God wasn't in the temples. God was with his true seed, maybe hiding in a cave. He was with that true seed, maybe in a little home meeting. He was with that true seed, maybe in the Colosseum facing death. That's where God was. But he says, those that have laid their treasures up in heaven... You may not get a statue of white stone here, he said, but don't worry. You'll have something like that there. Your treasures will be there. He said, it'll be white stone. You'll have treasures in heaven, and you will have a new name written in a white stone. He says, new names. He says, it could well be that name was our true and original name written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation of the world. He knows that name, but we do not. Think about it. You may not ever get nothing here as far as money and big white marble. He says, but there you'll be memorialized eternally and you'll be given a new name. Listen, we know all about new names. We know how Abraham and Sarah had to have a name change. We know all, all about those things, how, how Jacob had to have a name change. He says, you're going to get a name change. And he says, it just might be that original name that was written on the Lamb's book of life that he knows you by. But no man knoweth, because we don't know that name yet. He said, but he knows it. So what am I telling you? Lay your treasures up in heaven. You're going to get rewarded. If you've been struggling, li 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 listen to the warning and repent tonight. Quit chasing after earthly things, earthly idols. Don't get caught up in the things of Babylon. Don't get comfortable here in Babylon. There's a reward waiting for you. May we lay up our treasures there. May we press the battle and stay true to the original gospel, to the original truth that there is but one God. There is but one faith. There is but one baptism. There is one Lord and Father of us all. Stay true to that. And may we seek his will in our lives, young people, and not just his permission. Let's not be like Balaam. Seek his will for your life tonight with all your heart. Will you pray together with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you tonight. I know we've been lengthy. Lord, I understand, Lord, a lot of this, <laughs> I spoke a lot of words. But, Lord, I pray that we can just see that there is a truth in it all. There is a true God. There is a, a true way to worship. There is a way that you want it done. And, Lord, may we stay true. May we be true, Lord Jesus. Keep us true. Lord, not let us to divulge, Lord, off the path this way or that way. But may we keep our eyes focused on the prize, knowing that we'll receive a new name. Lord, written in the white stone, Father, that there's a reward. Lord, I pray that if there be one here tonight that's struggling, Lord, that's backslidden, Lord, right now, may you deal with that heart. Lord, may you call out to them and let them know that there's grace and there's mercy. They don't have to leave this building the same. But even tonight, Lord, Lord, there's a fountain open. There's mercy and there's grace. Lord, that's extended to each heart. Lord, as we look at the, the, the saints down through the ages that gave so much and sacrificed so much, Lord, it charges us. May we be willing to stand and finish this race. Lord, may we not lay down the baton so close to the finish line, but may we press the battle harder than ever with all that we have, Lord, until we cross, Lord, into that great glorious rapture. Lord, we just commit it all into your hands tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
to do. Amen. If you've been giving your time to other things, you want to just say, Lord, restore my joy, restore my time. Amen. Just take a moment to worship him.
fighting against the true church, Lord. Lord, as we just want to pray tonight, Lord, we need you now more than we ever have before. Lord, we want your word to be written on our hearts, Lord. Lord, your word in front of our faces each and every day, Father. Lord, we pray that you'll draw us closer to you, Lord. Lord, that you'll restore the time, Lord, that we Lord, spend in things that may not matter, Lord. Lord, the times, Lord, that we strayed away from giving you all that you're worthy of, Father. Lord, I pray that each one of us, as we leave here, Lord, will see the great need that we have for you, Lord, and the great abundant storehouse that you have willing to bestow upon each of us. Lord, for each one that's here, I pray, Lord, if there's anything that Lord, that we haven't given over to you, that tonight that we'll do that, Father. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this word tonight. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have tonight, Lord. Pray you'll bless our fellowship after we leave this place. Bless the refreshments, Lord. Bless each one that's here tonight. Lord, we give you all the praise that you're worthy of. And we thank you for this opportunity. Be with the service on Sunday, Lord. Lord, we want to come prepared, our hearts crying out for more of you, Lord. Lord, giving you all the praise and honor and glory that you're worthy of. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Oh, we'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Oh, we'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Go sing it. 